uh, we can actually image beta amyloid in the brain, or at least they can in Pittsburgh. Uh, and this is recent information. Looking at the left panel, looking at um, a control versus on the bottom, the Alzheimer's disease patient, you can see dramatically the amount of amyloid that you can actually image. Uh, I actually, we have a new technology in, in our uh, uh, clinic now, a very sophisticated, and Mark, this is coming to you, a very sophisticated um, piece of machinery to actually look at brain and brain function. And uh, this is, I'm kind of letting you in on something early. This is kind of exciting. Uh, I'll have you look at that. Not booting, let's see. Here we go. Can't do it. Okay, we'll look at it later. Here's something else that's very exciting. We talked about this model where these advanced glycosylated end products bind to their receptor. Recently discovered is the fact that the brain actually produces uh, something to intercept this activity called this secretory rage, where these uh, advanced glycosylated end products actually are bound out of this equation. And S-Rage can take these AGEs and keep them from binding to the cell. And uh, this has just recently been discovered. It was found that individuals with the um, highest amount of S-Rage have the lowest risk for Alzheimer's. So if you can increase the amount of these binders that can mop up these advanced glycosylated end products, then the risk of Alzheimer's goes down. And this was just published uh, a couple of months ago. This is probably not in your syllabus, is it? May or may not be. So um, if you look at Alzheimer's disease, AD, vascular dementia, and you measure the amount of this S-Rage, or binders for these um, modified proteins compared to control, you see that they have less S-Rage available. And interestingly enough, um, this whole process is what leads to, uh, helps to complicate the diabetic wound because the increased amounts of inflammation from the presence of these modified proteins. There is now topical S-Rage that can be given, used on diabetic wounds, and it dramatically increases wound healing. S-Rage compounds. So if you have it for a diabetic wound, we're hoping that soon that might be available for use uh, as a treatment for, for Alzheimer's and uh, Parkinson's. So vascular disease plays a big role. We know diabetics have vascular problems. We know that these glycated proteins play a role. And we know that amyloid is a focal point, not just because it's degenerated neurons, but it's a focus of inflammation, especially when it becomes glycated. Toxins play a role. We've all heard of MPTP. That's the synthetic Demerol analog that was developed in California in the early uh, 1980s that people began shooting up and would wake up the next morning with Parkinson's disease, full-blown Parkinson's disease. They would go to the emergency room with every symptom of Parkinson's and would actually be improved with L-DOPA therapy. Well, it was a hardship on them, but it provided research scientists with an incredible opening of a door to understand the mechanism by which uh, Parkinson's manifests. So subsequently, of course, every primate lab in the country started using MPTP, and we all of a sudden had a lot of Parkinsonian gorillas and orangutans used in, in study. Well, how it works is MPTP is modified by monoamine oxidase type B. What inhibits MAOB? Depranil and seleg or selegiline. Those are MAOB inhibitors. This is where this all came from. When they learned this mechanism, they figured, well, let's give a drug to it, because maybe there are like MPTP things in the environment. And once this is modified, MPTP2, this radical, it, it's a direct mitochondrial toxin which decreases ATP production. And that creates reactive oxygen species. When you damage mitochondria, you increase free radical production. And this in turn on nitric oxide synthase. We'll get to that. Um, well, interestingly, what has been found is that these individuals, several of them died many years later. In this case, I think it's 12 years later. And the reactive uh, inflammatory event in their brain stems, in the substantia nigra, is still going on after the one-time toxic experience 12 years ago. There's still microglia that are attacking those dopaminergic or dopamine-producing cells in the pars compacta of the substantia nigra. So they had a one-time event, and now the stage has been set, and this process continues as a feed-forward cycle. Once you damage those mitochondria, they become less functional, the process continues unabated. And clinically, they got worse with time. So let's look at this once more and recognize that ultimately then what happens is that Parkinson's is a mitochondropathy. We talked about other mitochondropathies in the past, like 
Oh, Kern-Sayre disease, progressive external ophthalmoplegia, and all these mitochondrial diseases, uh, Milos syndrome. But nonetheless, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, multiple sclerosis are primarily mitochondrial-based diseases. They are energy deficiencies. And in uh, Parkinson's, for example, they have a significant dysfunction of complex one of the electron transport chain, of the six levels of electron transport. And you can measure that. Not You don't have to do a brain biopsy. You can look at their platelets or their muscle cells. And you recognize that they're mitochondrial deficient throughout their bodies. It's why Parkinson's patients are tired. It's not necessarily from their drugs, although that's the first suspect. But what's the evidence that maybe there's some toxin involved that's not MPTP because all Parkinson's didn't shoot up the synthetic Demerol? Uh, this report... And back in 1990, 16 years ago, found an incredible increased incidence of Parkinson's in people who lived on a specific or several kibbutzim or group congregate living facilities in Israel. 500% increased risk of Parkinson's in this little pocket in Israel. And what was found was that these people shared a common water source. And that really points to some sort of toxic issue. And since then, we've learned that there are all kinds of, of toxic uh, influences on, on Parkinson's that relate, and especially pesticides. Um, this study shows that if you happen to um, be involved in the use of herbicides, your risk of Parkinson's goes up 300% insecticides as well. Just drinking well water, a, sl a slight increased risk. But farm living is a 37% increased risk of Parkinson's. And that's because of exposure. I mean, people think living on the farm. I can tell you in my office, when I see patients, I, I take their histories, and they've all, you know, most of them have something that we can identify. Uh, last week, it was uh, a woman who was a stewardess, and that's a risk because of, of cigarette smoking that she, because she had done this many years ago. I always thought that was interesting where they had a no smoking section of the plane. I mean, w that was like having a no peeing section in a public pool. You know, what was the point of that? Anyway, but it wasn't that, I thought, because what happened was beforehand, she worked in, in a restaurant that used charcoal. For 10 years, she worked in this restaurant that used charcoal to cook food. And that was probably it, but actually she had lived near a farm that actually grown corn right on her property when she grew up. So having a history of herbicide use increased the risk of Parkinson's by about 300%. Now, um, we know that many of the... How do these fungicides and pesticides work. They're mitochondrial toxins. They target mitochondrial function in the bugs. And we just talked about the fact that Parkinson's is a disease where the mitochondria are dysfunctional. Uh, pesticide found in par uh, to produce Parkinson's symptoms in rats, New York Times. It's rotenone. And rotenone produces Parkinson's in rats. It's used in, I don't know what a zillion is, but this comes from Emory University, that we use rotenone left, right, and center. Uh, and here is, you know, I had a patient tell me once that he remembers as a kid they used to chase the DDT sprayer that went through his neighborhood. He lived in Florida. And I, I couldn't believe that people would do that. And here it is. I mean, this is exactly that. Uh, Rosedale, Mississippi, children frolicking in the fog of pesticides sprayed regularly to control mosquitoes. And there, there, there's something wrong with this picture. We're doing something wrong. Gregory Bateson, the anthropologist, and philosopher said that man is the only animal who will befoul his own nest, a sure sign of madness, which essentially means you shouldn't poop where you eat, and this is what's going on here. Oh, well. Journal of the American Medical Association, back in 2000, exposure to home pesticides linked to Parkinson's disease. This is the AMA. Parkinson's disease, and this is very interesting, and look at the date. It may be triggered when individuals who have inherited a, a genetic susceptibility are then exposed. So you don't inherit a Parkinson's gene, which determines that you will get Parkinson's. What you inherit is a susceptibility. When you are then challenged by something environmental, you have the disease. We're going to look at that. But I published this three years prior to the JAMA uh, announcement, and that is that individuals with this genetic defects that have lead to deficiencies of detoxification can be at increased risk when they're exposed to what we call xenobiotic chemicals that are neurotoxic. Uh, if you look at the rat model, you found, interestingly, that there's an environmental toxin that leads to mitochondrial damage. And that environmental toxin that they're exposed to in this laboratory is levodopa that damages the mitochondria that can lead to Parkinson's. 